Hey everyone, Born to Run coach and author Eric Orton here. Welcome to the Cool Impossible Running Show, where we dream beyond fear and run beyond limits. Taking a deep dive into coaching, training, racing, and adventure that will help you accomplish your Cool Impossible. Zach Friedley. I'm David Kilgore. And we're here uh, to uh, run MCC. Yes, sir. We're ready for another big climb. It's cruising, man. It's so muddy. <laughs> Everyone's like sliding down. <laughs> Runner, on athlete, mountaineer, visionary race director, born to adapt founder and UTMB finisher, MCC. Zach Friedley, thanks for stopping by the Cool Impossible Running Show. Yeah, man. I'm definitely stoked to be here and uh you know get this podcast going. Yeah, your uh your backdrop is uh making mine look uh kind of kind of lame. So yeah, we'll, we'll, I, we'll get into it. what that's all about in a minute. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, you live in California, Northern California, but you spent kind of the majority of your summer over in Chamonix, France, training and doing race recon, course recon for UTMB. What what was it like to kind of become a, a local over there and then training and racing in France? It was, it was a dream come true to be there, you know, and to get familiar with the trails and the community and just the vibe of those mountains. Um, Cause last year I raced UTMB MCC and didn't have the result that I wanted. Um, so when you're trying to goal, sometimes you have to change the way you attack the goal. Um, and this year, you know, being in that Valley uh, training was probably the best move that I made in order to get the result that I wanted, which was the finish. Um, super easy to get to trails every day. I mean, you almost had to be careful not to overdo it because it was it's really easy to overdo it there. Um, not a lot of flat, definitely super big vert and um, a lot of good baked goods. So you got to be careful with that too. Over, over train and overeat. Yeah, um, I think it's easy to overtrain there. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, what, what was your, you know, it's probably even hard to get a warm up in, right? Yeah. I did a lot of my flat training there at the track, just so I, I, it's, it's like an environment that I can, that I can control. Um, whereas like trails there, you just, you, you never know. I mean, like a small vert thing there is maybe like 800 feet, which is huge here in California. Right. Right. Well, we'll, we'll get back to UTMB later, but, um, Let's kind of rewind a little bit and t- tell me about what what the two letters AK mean to you. <laughs> well, we're definitely not talking about the gun. Um, we're talking about uh, above knee. Okay, and, and tell tell us tell us about that. What what's the, what's that mean? What's the, what? Yeah, so I'm missing my leg above the knee. So when it comes to like people missing limbs, like the typical terms you'll hear is like AK above knee and BK below the knee. And the major differences between us, I don't have a knee, meaning that when I run or walk, I don't fire my quads or hamstrings in the typical fashion, whereas somebody would run quad control and hamstring control. Um, So to be an AK is just um, a little bit uh, more challenging maybe i mean i've never been a bk i'm sure it's super challenging as well um i do have a friend that has been a bk and now is an ak and tells me that it is nine day different yeah i can imagine so you're you're born this way or what t- tell us that whole story what what's what's the backdrop yeah, of- uh, yeah i was born that way 1984 uh, i was born and my parents were really young and uh, didn't expect to have a child with a disability. And back then, we didn't even use that term disability. Like my parents, we never really assigned that word to me until 
Um, I started to choose to identify that way in my 30s. That's a different story. But uh, essentially, yeah, 1984, born without a leg. Got my first prosthetic leg about one uh, from the Shriners Hospital. And back then, it was a wooden leg with, like, no no knee joint, just a piece of wood that had a hole in it that strapped around my body. And it progressively got a little better after the time. I think I had, like, probably 10 wooden legs, so I was about 10 or 11. And then uh, things started to develop even more um, with, like, a mechanical knee that was, like, maybe metal or titanium. And then um, I remember being around... 19 or 20, when the blade kind of came into mainstream media. Back then, you know, we didn't have Instagram or my, we didn't have MySpace or anything. So if you saw something, it was on TV or like in a magazine. And I remember seeing like a blade somewhere. And at that time, it was not your everyday piece of equipment. You had to be, I don't even know how you got a blade back then, to be honest. Um, I kind of fell into my first blade by accident. But um or by just destiny. I don't know how, how, however you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how I grew up. You know, I did sports, t-ball. I wrestled. I think if you were to talk to people from my childhood, they would say Zach, the wrestler. Um, running really wasn't there um, for me um, just because of the equipment and just because, you know, the like mass people there people missing legs didn't really, nobody really invited you to run to begin with. That's not something you could do. And I think that's why I connected with wrestling is because I didn't have my leg on. I wrestled with one leg and it was just my body and I adapted and, you know, learned how to be a wrestler with one leg. Since you were born this way, do you, did you feel like you were disabled? Did you feel challenged since it's all you ever knew? I don't think I felt challenged in the sense of being aware of it until like my mid thirties. Um, when I did a lot of like inner work with uh, my friend, Fred, who does like deep somatic work. I think what, one of my coping mechanisms as a kid um, and like even a young adult was like, don't even think about it. I just knew as a baseline, if I wanted to do something and do it well, I was probably going to have to work like three times as hard as the person standing next to me. Um, and that was just, normal that was like normal life for me um and i didn't think of it as bad or good that's just the way it is for me um which i think is what makes me having to work harder like i ever got um so growing up i don't think uh, i thought of myself as having a challenge definitely now as an adult absolutely had challenges all over the place yeah Going back to wrestling, you know, how did, how did that help you become a runner? Man, if you know anything about, about wrestling, uh, you gotta be extraordinarily mentally tough. And for me wrestling with one leg, I got my ass kicked a lot. And, um, especially the first three years, I think I maybe won like one or two matches. Definitely didn't win a match my first year. Definitely now my second year. And I think I started winning my third year. Um, so I just had to like get my ass whipped a bunch and then started getting better and better and better and seeing the progression. Um, and wrestling is a physically demanding sport. You, you know, somebody's physically on your body and you're getting beat up. And I think when I'm out there on the mountains and trails, it is absolutely hard. Um, you're getting beat up, but it's almost a little bit easier because nobody's like physically coming after you. So when I get in those challenging moments, I'm like, Oh, this actually isn't that bad. Right. Um, I'm going to make it through it. Right. Right. And so speaking of the challenges, wh what are some challenges that we as runners and athletes with two legs um, don't think about that you deal with daily? Um, well, one of the things that just comes to mind, it's been on my mind since UTMB and is uh, like whenever I descend a mountain that I realized on, the, I mean, I knew it, but I think I really deeply felt it this past race. Descending is extraordinarily hard on my body. It is so challenging. Like it's probably like 20 times more um, stress on my body than going down. If I had two legs, um, especially the steep stuff, you know? So I think that alone is something that 
um, is, is a huge challenge. Um, and that's like my next frontier is how do I maybe cut that challenge in half? Um, but that, yeah, that's probably a challenge everyday life. Um, I depend on a prosthetic to work, you know, I mean, there's been times in my life where my leg is unexpectedly broke and I'm down and out for however long it takes for me to get it fixed. And I can't get it fixed sometimes, uh, even in my community, I have to hop on an airplane and go to Chicago. And so that's something that I live with every day. That's kind of a challenge, you know? Is, is that on your mind while you're running? Holy crap, I'm going to I'm gonna break this thing and maybe not even be able to get home? So luckily, it's maybe a stupid way to live, but I don't feel that way until after I'm done. <laughs> 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 like, wow, what would have happened if I would have broke that out there? How would I get back? So I don't really have those in the moment thoughts, but it, it crosses my mind. Um, and it crossed my mind even whenever I'm climbing like Cotopaxi or something, when you're when there's like consequences for, for stuff like that, you know, uh, um, which I think is what is the thrill of tra- like of trail riding for me and being on mountains is like, it might be sketchy. Right. Absolutely. So you, you, you've decided to wear your blade throughout the entire day, not only running. Yeah. Why, why is that? And mo- most people do not do that. Yeah. So I haven't met one person ever in my life that, as their running leg is their everyday leg. And I think it was around 2019. Um, you know, I just come across born to run the event and ran in this trail event and had imagined myself maybe even a little before the event being up in the mountains. And it was just so out of reach for me. Um, but I knew I, I could maybe do it. So I think I just knew that I had, to. Uh, really dedicate myself to my running gait if I wanted to be comfortable enough in that setting with a running blade. So it was a decision I made in 2019 and I just kept going. Here we are in 2023 and um, just getting done with UTMB MCC. I think it was a pretty wise decision um, to just go full in on it, you know? So you're, you're basically just training your mind and your body every minute of the day to be used to that blade. And, and how would a blade paint that picture. How would a blade perform or respond differently than kind of an everyday, um, you know, walking leg? Yeah. I hate to say, use these words, but a walking leg makes me feel lazy because it gives you a lot of assistance and like, uh, comfort and ease. And it makes walking and the motions just super easy. Um, which is great for your body and great for everyday life but I don't want to have those tendencies when I'm out on a mountain. I want to be, I want my whole body to be engaged. I want to be alert um, and not depend on something so much um, that I could maybe fall down or something. So for having, having my running leg on all the time just keeps me engaged with my brain 24 seven, which, you know, there's moments on the mountain when I'm running and I feel my blade slip out from under me, but I'm like, it doesn't impact me because I'm just so used to that motion. Whereas if I switch back and forth, that could be a devastating moment for me to have something slip and I just smash, fall down and get hurt. Got it. Wow. So do you, do you remember, had you always wanted to run? Like you, you mentioned, you know, we're during wrestling, Hey, the, you know, no one asked you to go, go for a run or participate. Is it something that, when, when did it enter your mind? Um, young i mean i I grew up watching like you know the nfl like prime time you know that's a that's like the hot topic right now yeah yeah and when i was a kid he was this phenom athlete that was like so fast and you know talked about speed and i i was really interested in all that stuff um you know even watching the olympics um i come from kansas city missouri and one of the big olympians from kansas city was maurice green who was the 100 meter world record holder so he was like in my orbit um, as a kid. And I I think speed was something I was drawn to and like running, but we didn't really, it wasn't really possible then, you know, like 10 year old Zach didn't have a blade. I wasn't fast by any means. If anything, I was the slowest kid on my T-ball team, slowest kid in wrestling practice, slowest kid uh, football practice. Uh, But I, I was a dreamer, man. I dreamed of taking punts to the house 
you know, stuff like that. But, uh, but I was definitely, I envisioned it happening. Well, and, and that's what this whole podcast is about is people who, who, who see, see something and dream something and live beyond fear. And so what is it like now to be a professional runner? What's that feel um, like? It's, it's a dream come true. So I'm 39 years old. I feel like, um, I haven't even hit the peak of my running yet. I don't know. I got to ask my coach what he thinks, um, but I feel Just scratching the surface. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot left in me. Um, I've been working towards this. I mean, honestly, I feel like since I was like six years old, just chipping away, maybe I didn't know what it was at six years old. Um, but it all, all those things I did in wrestling and in high school and lifting weights and Paralympic track all got me to this moment where I'm at now. And now I feel like, um, you know, I can achieve anything I put my mind to. I mean, just doing UTMB MCC my first year and not making it to the first cutoff and seeing those mountains and feeling that race and being like, wow, this might be on paper impossible, but I believed in myself enough that I could, you know, put one foot in front of the other essentially over the next year and figure out a strategy to get myself the best um, performance I could do, which would hopefully be a finish. And we did it, man. And it just shows that that anything is possible. I think consistency is the key. Having the vision and and like the goals, and just taking one foot in front of the other, and you'll eventually get there. I, I think for people who are following a different path, like you, um, have a dream and see this vision of what you want your life to be. I think there's a moment in time when there's a certain amount of skepticism or discouragement that comes with that, that is natural and necessary. Um, but it makes us wonder if we're on the right path and then something happens in a good way that completely lets you know, you're on the right path. And what was that moment for you? Well, the, the first moment, so I'm going to go back to the race. And when I got to that first check, point almost 60 minutes ahead of where I was last year that's when I knew I was like oh wow um the work that we've done the last year is definitely it's paying off right now I can see it so that gave me almost like a mental edge that I had what it takes to finish because in one year to drop 60 minutes off your time you know in like a massive storm even it was like a huge confidence booster um so that's one thing that stands out but also along the way of just, you know, showing up every day and not letting those like, what if, am I good enough? Those are, I just like observe those things go by. Those aren't real. Um, what is real is like showing up every single day, doing your best. Those are the things that you can kind of control. Um, so that's kind of what I focus on, on, you know, through the training. And, and with all of this, with you becoming a pro pro athlete, um, you have a great relationship with on running. How how did that come about? And to talk to us about that relationship and how how fortunate yeah. you are to be with with such a great brand. So that came about in 2021. So what'll it be in 2023? Yeah, so 2021. Um I I quit my job uh December 2021 and said, you know what, I'm taking my running. And I want to be a professional athlete with no sponsors, nothing. Um, and went to the U.S. trail running conference, spoke about inclusion and in trail running, kind of told my dreams and ambitions to that audience. Went on Lewis Escobar's podcast, talked again about my dreams and ambitions. Um, you know, then you guys invited me down to be in the book. And we did the book. And that was like a really big moment in my life. Um, and then kind of bouncing around with phone calls with like other brands. And then like at the last minute, I was going to sign with another brand, I'm not going to mention who, but another big brand. And at the last minute, this company on was on the radar. And basically my friend, Jordan Daniels um, was, we were talking about stuff and running and she's like, let me connect you with this brand on never heard of on at the time. And I had a call with somebody in Zurich kind of painted the, my picture of, Hey, I'm a guy with one leg and I have this ambition to run professionally. Uh, it's not really being done. So we're going to have to like create our, this paradigm that doesn't exist, which a lot of people didn't get. A lot of brands were like, Hey, 
uh, what you're trying to do doesn't exist. Sorry. And I'm like, well, yeah, no duh. Like that's the whole point. Like we're trying to create this thing. So my first call with on was amazing. And then they connected me with this guy who's now my really good buddy. And he was my pacer at MCC. His name is David Kilgore. And I remember my call with David crystal clear. Cause I kind of tease him about it. I basically told this guy exactly my big picture vision and my dream that hasn't been done. And David's like, yeah, man, let's do it. And I was like, what? He was just like, yeah, I love it. Let's like, how do we move forward with the next steps? And, um, you know, he sent me my athletes, um, like term paper. We made some adjustments because that's really kind of geared towards, uh, podium finishes in the pro world. And there's not that opportunity for me in the pro world right now. That's part of my mission is to create some sort of elite level, um, system for adaptive athletes like myself so they adjusted some things to make it work for me um and you know i have a contract i'm fully supported with a salary um travel bonuses for races uh, i get to go all over the world and talk about running and inclusion you know we've been to new zealand Ghana, spain um and we're just now getting started you know well and that's a great segue into born to adapt so you know, we, we've talked a lot about your running and your racing and there, there's a bigger, there's a bigger thing going on here. Talk to us about yeah. Born to Adapt. Yeah. So Born to Adapt is this vision um, that started, you know, around the Born to Run stuff. Uh, I went to this event that some of you may have heard called Born to Run Ultra Marathon that's done by Lewis Escobar. And I ran this race back in 2019. It was the first time I'd never ran on a trail. It was like 10 miles. I'd never run further than three miles at the time. And when I crossed the finish line, I got extraordinarily emotional and I've never felt this way. And it was totally unexpected. I had no idea people get emotional when they run. Um, and my first thought was like, how come nobody told me about this? Like, why am I just now finding this out at like 30, I think I was like 35 years old. This is insane. Like I've been an athlete my whole life how can I just be finding out about this now? And I had to, I had these discussions and thoughts with Lewis and, you know, he's got a platform himself. And I was like kind of pleading to race directors of like, Hey, tell people with disabilities that have blades that are in wheelchairs that this exists. And nobody really did anything. It was kind of like, Oh, great idea, man. Like so awesome. But like nothing happened. And then one day Lewis is like, dude, why don't you make it happen? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm a race director. I can teach you the things that I know about race directing. And we can do this together. And you can be the guy behind this movement. Um, what do you want to call the event? So we're like kind of going back and forth for a few days. And Lewis actually came up with the term, how about born to adapt? And I was like, dude, I love it. And uh, the first born to adapt happened in 2022 in Los Olivos at the Born to Run Ultra Marathons. And the uh, vision behind Born to Adapt is just creating uh, a trail event for disabled athletes from wheelchair, cerebral palsy. Um, we had our friend Victor, who's a, a brain injured, and just get them comfortable in the outdoors, create like a really manageable, like single, not single track, but like single kilometer, single mile loop that they can run on um, and see where it goes. And um, kind of give them a place to feel safe and be outside and where it's gone. So we did this in 2022 and we had like eight or nine people show up, do the one mile loop. And then in 2023, I extended it to a 10 mile and 30 mile event. And we had one of our first ever uh, born to death athletes, Ryan Turner, who did like 15 miles the first year. He did his first really aggressive trail run at born to run or born to adapt. Um, and that's kind of my idea is like get these people a taste of something and just see where they go. Cause that's what happened to me. I went and did this thing and it changed my life. And now I'm running in UTB events all over the world. And then so that's born to adapt. Yeah. So what, what, what's the plan then for zoo New Zealand? You're going to go to New Zealand in what, February? Um, yeah. So basically I went to New Zealand this year and ran Terrawera, which is a UTB event. Um, but like a long standing trail event there in the North Island in a community called Rotorua. And they actually have redwoods there, which I live in the redwood forest in Northern California. So it's 
felt super mystical to be in this other part of the world in the redwood trees on this community that is amazing there like the people of new zealand um, just have a different vibe than us they are really embrace things like disability um and i could just see that if we had an event there that it'd be a really good place um to roll something out um like you know our running clinic um the event but on a bigger scale um and then maybe we could uh, replicate this thing around the world and new zealand's just like the place that we do it and maybe hit a home run um so this february coming february february 2024 we'll have a running clinic on friday it's all inclusive people with, with uh, disabilities people that aren't disabled everybody comes together um, we're going to have about 100 people there and share some running drills and just have fun and build community. And then the next day in the Redwood Forest, we'll have the original Born to Adapt uh, wheelchair accessible loop. We'll have a 5K and a 10K for anybody that wants to get a little bit of wild because we got some like vert potentially um, and just have our own event there and see what happens. Let's let's take all that and move into uh, UTMB. Paint that picture. So I want to jump back in. There was a one of your final training runs. I think we aborted what I had originally assigned for that day. And you said, hey, I want to finish seeing and running the course. And after that day, we talked and you basically had to crawl parts of this course T take us through that day and this is what three four weeks before the race and talk to us what's going through yeah. your mind and, and what that day meant to you yeah so luckily i met up with some people that i know um one guy in in, in particular from the u.s uh his name's edder belmonte he comes to born to run and he just happened to be there running and I've been looking at this section of the UTMB MCC course that looked really crazy on paper. And I've seen pictures and I just kind of knew that I needed to go do this with, with like other people. It just had that like kind of buzz in my stomach that I should probably take some other people. So we went with a guy that he knows um, who, who knew me from the born to run two book, which was really cool. Um, he's from Switzerland somewhere. And then my buddy from Chile that I met, his name's Mateus who is a pro trial runner from Chile race in the world champs was just there in the area running these mountains. So all of us get on this bus. Um, first I got to tell you, I did try to hitchhike there, but nobody picked us up. <laughs> um, so we, we took the train. Um, then we had to get a bus because when you're crossing the border between France and Switzerland, the transportation kind of stops. So you got to hodgepodge it together. Um, so we took a train and then we got on another train and then we got on a bus and the bus dropped us off in this little town called Triant. And Triant's a really iconic place of the UTMB races because there's a pink church there. So if anybody's ever watched the live stream, there's a big aid station there. It's a crucial point in the race. Uh, you probably know where it is. Um, so this section of the MCC takes place right there. And it's basically this climb up to one refuge and then you you circumnavigate around this mountain to another refuge called Kolde Bomb. And it's maybe like a 10 or 12K. Um, but it, I've heard through other people at this point that it was like really technical and that I should get my eyes on it. So uh, we were starting that journey up this deal. And these rain clouds came in. Sunny day went away. And it became thunderstormy. And uh, we got to the first refuge started to kind of ice hail on us. And I remember being like, shit, like, uh, like, what do we do here? Do we keep going? Do we go back. So we made the call to keep going and they got like fixed cables in the rock wall. I mean, you were talking like almost kind of like Yosemite half dome cables, uh, where you got to grab on. And if you let go, you might be falling off a mountain. So we're dealing with that. Uh, the weather, I got the guys with me are like, Zach, are you sure this is part of the course? And I'm like, dude, this is what it says. Like this is, that's how crazy it was. So we did it. Uh, we finished it. We got to the part where we, where we needed to. And it was like really severe weather. And I remember thinking at the time, like, well, I did it in the rain. So, I mean, 
it's only going to get better. So probably on race day, I'll do it in, in the sun and whatnot. And thank God we did it in that weather because the day that I actually raced was two or three times worse than that. <laughs> so, um, you know, the universe has a mysterious way of setting you up for something. And I think that was just like a gift um, that I needed because it gave me massive amounts of confidence on race day that I was prepared. I like, I'd done the hardest part in crazy weather. Let's go. And we went. Well, and that, that, that was, that conversation opened my eyes to the real challenge of what you go through is you were telling me on that training day that you had to crawl along. Yeah. And I'm like, why did he have to crawl? Yeah, and man. then you told me, well, I was worried that my blade would shoot me off the cliff. And that's yep. what it hit me. It was like, wow, that's something I would never even think about. So talk talk yeah, about, man. about that. Like, I mean, that's that's real. Yeah, that that's real. So it's part of the reason why I wear it every day. Because you got to be that dialed into something. I mean, I hope my mom's not listening, but it's like life or death. You yeah. know, like if I didn't dedicate my everyday life to this leg, there could be a moment on a mountain like that that just plops me in the wrong direction and I'm, I'm off a mountain or I'm falling catastrophe. I'm like smashed my face or broke bones. Um, it wouldn't be good. So I can anticipate those things. I like see those things before they happen. I'm very tapped into my body and I just know I have like a knowing of my body awareness and sometimes I got to crawl because the risk factor outweighs the, like what I'm comfortable with. Um, so I feel more in control when I crawl in certain, uh, like I'm more safe and stable. It's not ideal, but my number one goal is to stay safe out there and live to see another day. Sometimes you got to crawl. Yeah. I like it. So what's, what's that mountain in the background? Oh, that's Cotopaxi from, from last year. Yeah. So how did climbing Cotopaxi help you for UTMB? Oh, man. Uh, talk, what, me... what's, what's the what's the stats at Cotopaxi? So it's like 6,000 meters, which is basically 19,347 feet. Um, pretty tall. How long did it take uh, you? We started the summit push at 11 p.m., I got to the summit around 7 a.m. and then got back to the refuge around 1 p.m. So it was a long time. Um, we also did it in inclement weather, lightning storm. Um, I mean, you're on a glacier, got crampons on. There's absolute danger. Uh, there, there's you know fixed ropes. I mean, people have lost their lives up there. Um, so it was probably the most danger. I'd ever been in essentially. I mean, it was like, like managed, it was like managed risk. I, I climbed with a professional, uh, legendary Carl Egloff. Um, and I think for me, a lot of people don't know, I'm like really terrified. And I mean, terrified of heights where it paralyzes me. Like the fear is immense. And I think that's kind of why I'm drawn to mountain running, um, and putting myself in these situations to just kind of play around with that fear. And, uh, and see how I can maneuver through it. And that was one of those moments where it was dark when we started. I had a headlamp on. So I had like a vision of right out in front of me. And I was moving amazing till about 4.35 in the morning. Uh, we were on the fixed ropes. And that's right when the sun started to crack. And then it illuminated everything. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, how did I get here? This is insane. And my body like froze up. I went down to one knee and basically had a panic attack. Maybe Carl Egloff had to come down um, and tell me that I was strong enough to continue. Um, trust my guides, trust the people around me, trust my own strength. And then at the very end, he's, if you don't get up, I'm going to carry you. And Carl's not a big dude. And I was like, man, I was like, I can't let Carl carry me up this mountain. So that was like, for whatever reason, what I needed to to hear to get up and continue on and reach the summit. The summit was only like a hundred meters further. So I was like super close and I quit like, you know, right at like the last crux of the, of the entire climb. 
Um, but yeah, working through that, you know, and then coming back home and I work with, I describe him as like a shaman, uh, but he does like deep somatic work with my body, uh, my energy and like my mind and spirit. And Fred and I were on the table. He's working on me and he kind of tapped into my like fight or flight nervous system. And we, we talked through that intense moment of fear on the glacier that I experienced. And we kind of talked through how I was going to um, interact with that the next time I felt that in my gut. Because I feel it in my gut and I feel it in my bones. And when I was up there, it made me like collapse in and like paralyzed. And so now I had the ability when I see that, at least we were hoping I would, where instead of collapsing, I would recognize the fear. I would honor the fear, but I wouldn't let the fear collapse me. And I would just move carefully knowing that I'm not going to move the fear. I'm not going to make the fear any smaller, but I can impact how I maneuver around the fear. Um, and that helped me uh, in my, in my actual race um, being on those massive exposed cliffs and just being like, Oh, I remember this feeling. This is the Cotopaxi feeling. I have the tools and the toolkit to maneuver through this. And it helped me like tremendously. I I think many athletes look at elite athletes and think they don't have fear, but they, they don't realize that we all have fear and the elites just deal with it differently. And, and I yeah. love that story. And do you, do you think your fear is related to your leg or independent of your leg? I think my fear comes from, it's almost like that horse. When you bring a horse really close to the edge of a cliff, they know something ain't steady and they'll, it'll spook them. I think there's something in me that in those really extreme moments, uh, my like unconscious or maybe my conscious recognizes that I'm depending on something that is a, almost like a tool and it could, it could like get out at any time. Um, so I'm having to trust this thing, you know, to like keep me upright. So I think a lot of that has to do with it, um, on a psychological level. Um, you know, like, like when I'm in an elevator going up a bunch of floors, I don't feel that same. I get, I, I see the heights and I'm like, well, but I don't feel that same, like drop to my knees, like let's collapse in because I'm like secure behind, you know, solid steel. But when you're out in the open and something could buckle on my leg and I'm off a cliff, I think hundred percent it has to deal with it. And did that moment on code epoxy, change how you felt about the accomplishment what do you mean what was it more of a, an accomplishment knowing that you had to overcome you were going to be carried up the mountain <laughs> um yeah how much think... was that necessary to amplify the 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 sense of accomplishment that you'll always remember yeah i mean i think it was huge i mean it, i feel like for me there might have been moments like that could have actually moment might have been like symbolic of many other moments in my life where I maybe quit before I got to where I needed to go. You know, like my story isn't necessarily like I don't just win everything. I feel like there's probably more failures I could tell you about than successes. Um, so it was almost like symbolic for my whole life. I was in this intense moment. I tried to quit. The people around me wouldn't let me quit. And, you know, that's another thing is like having the right people around you. You know, Carl knew what to say. It's not his first rodeo. And then giving me that ability uh, to like grab a hold of my power in that moment and like come to the top. So, I mean, it was like a moment that I probably, you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's huge in my life. Uh, I reference it a lot um and just everyday life it, i re, i recall it like frequently so it was very wow you know i think it would it did intensify because if i would have just been like oh my crush cotopaxi no problem you know i might not have had that lesson that i needed right and you you're gonna say how that helped you at utmb obviously you didn't have that acute situation as you had on the mountain but now you're able to recognize when you start maybe having that fear and can and correct it and and listen yep. to it and, and push it aside. What's what's your yeah, what's your strategy 
in a race like UTMB when things are tough and things are tough for everybody, but now you have this great strategy, whether it's from Fred's help, all your experiences, how do you push that aside and not do away with it, but just push it aside to keep going? I think my just willpower to want to accomplish my goal um, and knowing before the actual thing happens that there's going to be some moments that you're going to just have to kind of like observe things, not make it like your reality and just watch, watch those feelings go by. Um, Cause they're going to be temporary um, and it's going to be a long ass day. So you're going to have a couple of them, you know, so All just right. having that mindset, uh, and I think too, you gave me some really good detail. A lot of people visualize, visualize yourself crushing this thing and like being this champion and feeling great and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, that's awesome. But how about visualize it when you're like crushed and it sucks and you don't know if you can continue, how are you going to react in those moments? And I never visualized that way. I've only visualized the so-called positive moments. So I think this time around, I visualized those dark moments of like massive climb that never ends and it it's muddy and you're this hurts and this hurts and this hurts. What are you going to do? And I was, I felt those moments. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what's ultra running is all about. It's, it's, can you perform when you don't want to? And yeah. that's, that's a lot of the the mistake I see with visualization is you just, you paint a pretty, pretty picture and even at the best races, there's not pretty moments at, at times. And so Take us to those those moments. Let's let's go. Let's dive into UTMB now. Let, let give us the stats. So it was a, uh, it was supposed to be a forty k, but it was longer than that, right? Yeah, according to my Garmin and Strava, it's fifty five k. I mean, I, I don't know what is right. Um, so there's that. It's got about eight or nine thousand feet of vert. Um, you start in Martigny, Switzerland, and you go to Chamonix, and you got a climb right out of the right out of the chute that goes about uh 8k with about 3500 feet like right off right off the bat then you get to the top there and then you drop down probably about a five or eight hundred foot descent into triant and then you have about a one or two k flat in triant and then you have another massive climb all the way up to cold Bay bomb which is iconic in the chamonix valley it's a really famous refuge that looks over the valley in both directions. Um, and it's also the border of uh, France and Switzerland. Um, and then you take a, a descent down into Latour and then you go through Argentier and then drop down into Chamonix and then you finish. So um, it was a long day, you know, each, I broke the race up into sections in my mind. Um, the first being that climb that I did last year. And that's as far as I made it. Um, and we got there 60 minutes earlier. And I do got to paint the picture. It was the worst weather I'd ever ran in in my entire life. Uh, it rained or snowed the entire time. There wasn't one moment of break from, from that aspect. Uh, in the valley where we started, it was kind of hot rain. At the top of the first climb, it started to get cold. Um, and then the descent down into Triomphe hot again and then cold again all the way up at the cold day bomb where it was snowing and when so there was all sorts of different types of weather which with a prosthetic is like ultra challenging because you're navigating these different environments you know the sweat the cold the sweat the cold impacts how my limb does inside my socket um, but luckily we made a beautiful uh, socket back in may that didn't give me any problems it did what it was supposed to do which is insane for 55k um so I had a lot of good things happening. I felt prepared, um, I should say, um, especially after that first checkpoint. It was like reassuring. Um, it's really interesting because when I got to the checkpoint, if I would have gauged last year's and this year's, I'd have been like, wow, those felt the same. I struggled the entire time. That sucked. But knowing the data, I was like, wow. I actually improved by 60 minutes. That's insane. Like, so I think the data points are huge for an athlete because our mind doesn't have the clear picture. Um, so knowing those things that are actual facts really help to gauge where you should be feeling. So having that right away, was like, wow, I 
trust my training. I trust the work I've done. I, I'm prepared for this. I got what it's going to take, what ended up being the next nine hours. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was really crucial for me. And so we got lost a few times, got back on course, made it to the finish line. Um, all my teammates were there. Other people were there. And I did it in like 11 hours, 32 minutes. Um, so we kind of like put the flag down of like, at least for AK runners, like, you know, this is, um, this is possible. Like, you know, this is, here's the benchmark, um, come get some. So I think that's what we wanted to achieve and it wasn't pretty. Um, but it took a lot of the support from on, um, my teammates, you know, everybody around, it took my community that i have at utmb not necessarily the utmb community it was like our own community um and we're going to build from there i mean i'm really excited to to do that i mean to finish that race from last year just you know, it's like like one giant stride like i made huge improvement um and i'm just like thrilled with my result so if anybody's seen the finish of utmb Walk us through what's what's going through your head. You're running down Main Street, Chamonix. People are lined yeah. up on either side. You're like trucking it. What yep. you know? It it gave me goosebumps watching it. I imagine what you're going through. Is it is it slow motion like being like in the zone, or is there like no thoughts and it's so surreal? What's going through your head? So yeah, I love this question. So for me. I've probably envisioned that running through the shoot, through the town, through the finish. I'm not even kidding you. I probably envisioned it a thousand times, um, especially during the training for the last year when I, we would do a workout and it was getting challenging. I had the wristband from UTMB 2022 on my hand and look down. I'd see the wristband, remember what it felt like to get kicked off the course, to not achieve my goal. And I would visualize myself you know, running down the street through the finish line so many times. Like even in Mendocino, when I'm at home in the Redwoods, I'd be like, oh, I got like two more miles. Should I keep going? Do I have what it takes? And I would remember those those feelings and those visualizations. So to have it happen in real life, I was just like, hell yes, dude. Like we did it. The pain of my body went away because I was definitely wrecked uh, at that point. But I, I ran pretty fast through there. I think I was running like maybe like a seven minute mile pace through town, um, which is nuts. Yeah. Um, and then just crossing the finish line. Uh, I, I guess I did what they call the like mic drop of joy running, which is throw the poles, which I didn't even know. Like it just kind of happened. And then I fall down on the stage and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh my God, I'm here. I'm like resting. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's people around me. So then I shoot back up and my teammates hug me. Um, and it was like a lifetime experience, you know, it was just like really cool to feel supported by my family of on athletes, uh, my wife, everybody. It was a dream come true for definitely 12 year old Zach. Well, and seeing you at born to run and born to run, born to adapt and seeing what you're doing with Victor and Sean, we haven't even talked about Sean. We'll maybe leave that for another episode. But what you, what you're doing for the community is is just amazing and so inspiring and it, it inspires me to get out there and we're gonna do a sky race together one of these days, um, Dude, yeah. Those look nuts, don't they? Yeah. So so what what is next for you? Walk us to 2024. Yeah. So I mean, what's next right around the corner is I'm going to Ecuador to climb Cayambi, yeah. which is right. another six thousand meter. So that's gonna be a pretty difficult challenge, but I feel really prepared in a sense that I kind of know what to expect. I like the pace of mountaineering. I feel like I still got some climb in my legs left from the UTMB stuff. So I'm excited about that, to do that with the adaptive community. What I what I don't think a lot of people know is I do that climb with other adaptive athletes. And I think this year there's at least three other AKs. So I really like being around other AK athletes and doing like really crazy shit. And so it's going to be fun to, to like have that. And then – the rest of the year, we're going to put together a nice training block. Um, we're going to do uh, Terawera again in New Zealand um, and, and uh, in a line with my uh, Born to Adapt event that we're doing together. Um, I want to go sub three hours at Terawera. I think I did three hours 20 uh, this year, and I think I can go maybe like 
255. I don't know. Like, we'll see what the body has. Um, kind of developing maybe a different mountain running system with my prosthetist, uh, giving me some more support for the descents. Um, but that's tricky too, because I don't want to lose what I have on the ups on the flats. So we got to figure that out, which is really fun to do. Um, I'm going to go to Europe a little bit sooner, I think, and uh, train for UTMB 2024. Maybe do um, some more World Series events in Italy and Spain. Maybe a sky race. So I'm, I've been peeping those out. Those look like really fun. Um, and we're going to do a, the original Born to uh, Adapt as well in Los Olivos in May. Um, you and I are going to have that running clinic in New Zealand and just kind of see where we can take uh, this like wave that we're on, you know, and grow the chart running community for the adaptive world. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, all right. I think that's a good spot to wrap it up. Um, give a shout out to your sponsors. Who's who's supporting you? So the OG sponsor is Ghost Leaves. They were the first brand to uh, basically, I told them what I wanted to do. And they said, we want to be a part of it. We believe in what you do. And I think that set the tone um, for the rest of the people that showed up, which is on, who gets me everywhere and gives me the equipment that I need to support everywhere. I mean, they support not only me, but they support the communities that I, I represent. Um, you know, they're big sponsors in the romp climb in Ecuador. Um, they sponsor my friends uh, that did this head to coast run a couple of weeks ago. Um, so they really have shown up for this community um, that I represent, uh, you know, huge. So on is amazing. Uh, Buff, my Catalonian homies uh, that I have their headwear. Um, if you haven't uh, ever checked out Buff, you should check them out. Uh, cool, cool products. Um, who else do I have? I'm, am I leaving somebody out? Um, I don't yeah, know. I need, some more. I need some more sponsors. Yeah. I need some Red Bull. <laughs> No, no more the Walter watermelon. It was all Courtney's dude, fault, right? Dude, that wrecked me. Uh, it was too sweet. I, I dumb move, but I didn't want to go with caffeine um, early in a race. But I do think it helped me later in the race when I did give myself caffeine. I felt a rejuvenance of something. Cool. All right. Well, this has been awesome. Um, and we'll, we'll end it by saying that uh, we've got some fun plans, you and I, for this channel. And we're going to be, my followers and subscribers are going to be seeing a lot more of Zach. And we, we've got some cool things planned. So stay tuned. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll we'll talk soon. I'm excited, man.